to destruction. I mean, I don't know. I don't they can't do nothing about the phenomena of nature. Meanwhile, well, you have to ask yourself, why would they waste their time messing with the Nuwabians, as they like to call it, Nuwabians? Why would they be messing with the Nuwabians at this close proximity to destruction? I mean, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm not going for the, oh boy, he's a doomsday preacher. You don't have to believe, you don't, <laughs> I do not care if you don't believe this stuff getting ready. I don't care if you don't believe the meteorite right to come in. Your government knows it. <laughs> you know what? This week they had on the news that they uh, figured out a way to regrow the bone. And they figured out a way to reanimate tissue. Now, no, that's on the news. We have, you know, we we we, we stay in there. Anybody? Did anybody hear about it? Well, we did. Check it. Go on your computer. The people of, of African descent, keloid, is because there was a time where we were able to rip our limbs as gods. They thought I was crazy. They said that nigga is nuts. Anyone in the world would have their arm cut off and it regrow. Well, now the scientists are saying they can regrow limbs. They can, your, your bone can be cut off here, and they have a way now where that bone will go back and that flesh can grow back. But they grew an ear on a rack, and y'all saw that in television. Well, of course, they can grow your finger back. What does that mean? It means one thing, that the scientific community is being exposed to things they never was exposed to before. Whole new science. Carson is ready to have an operation to repair his ear. He may be in line for a remarkable new technology being developed here at the University of Massachusetts. A technology that won't just fashion him an ear from existing tissue, but one that through tissue engineering will actually grow him a new one. This is an example of growing an ear in the shape of a human ear on a rabbit ear. So it's actually an ear grown on an ear. That's just one of the wonders Dr. Charles Vacanti of the UMass Medical Center has created. His most memorable to date is this now famous mouse with a human-shaped ear growing on its back. The ear was made from cow cartilage, which grows much more easily than human tissue. But Vacanti has since been able to grow ears made of human cartilage in mice. I think we're very, very close. I suspect probably less than two years, probably within a year, of doing the same thing in a human. For example, if this was Carson's ear, we would first make a mold of his ear. To engineer tissue, Bacanti first molds a biodegradable scaffold in the shape of the body part, then covers it with the appropriate cells. As the cells grow, the scaffold melts away, leaving what just a few years ago would have seemed impossible. As a medical advance, I suspect that tissue engineering will be as significant as antibiotics. It's not just ears Bacanti is creating, but other structures like a windpipe and hard to repair bone. He's also found a way to make nerve cells divide and grow, a potential treatment for brain and spinal cord injuries. Other scientists are growing organ tissue and Bacanti foresees a day when injured or ill people will have replacement parts grown for them. For example, you have liver failure. 
instead of having to wait until a donor liver is available, I believe you'll be able to engineer a liver of your own cells. Grow your own liver. Grow your own liver. Something else we mentioned, they recently mentioned, all of y'all know, hope y'all did. They talked about children and the father's only 10% of the child now and the mother's 90%. Do you know that? Oh well, yeah. See, here's what happened. This is gonna get into your doctrine in a way where if you really get into it, you go, if you don't know the doctrine, this might not catch you. The um, woman, the woman's body, mitochondria DNA, which predates man by a thousand years, when woman was God. Woman's body has a defense mechanism in it. Do we agree? Yes. Like a man's body. No, somebody said, well, if you take alien blood from anybody, I'll make it clear, and inject it into a woman, in six to eight weeks, her blood will overthrow that alien blood. You know, that's why they have to be very careful with transfusions that they get people who have the same type of blood because your body will reject it. Now, transplanting organs has proven that to be a fact, that if they give you someone else's heart, the problem is always what? Rejection. Why does it reject you? Because your body has a built-in mechanism for it to defend itself against alien properties of all kinds. And even in the blood, ask anybody about blood. If you inject blood, if you have to, if you have to get a transfusion, your body will overthrow that blood in six to eight weeks or that blood, or it will eventually kill you. If they add a liver to your liver, they have a certain amount of time. They must keep your body constantly uh, filled up with, what do you call it? No, anti what? I'm trying to do, but I'm trying to do simple way better. Is the way we use, um, not antibiotics, uh, it goes, you have a, a body that attacks everything. Your immune system, thank you. They got to keep inject, injecting you with serums to keep your immune system extremely high. They right now say if you have cancer and you have a very high immune system, then you can, of course, take radiation, chemotherapy, but if you don't, it'll kill you. That's understood. Well, that's because it's alien to the body. You with me so far? All right. So now, once you establish the immune system and keeping the immune system, so therefore any alien organs would be able to survive for a period of time, but they have not succeeded yet with any transplants. Right here in your lower abdomen. This is an intriguing thought to patients suffering from kidney failure, like Kate Sullivan. Faced with a lifetime of dialysis, she recently had to ask someone close to her to make a difficult decision. My sister and I are super close, and I couldn't think of anybody else that would go through the kind of surgery that it is. I mean, it's not, it's not simple, and there's a lot of pain involved and a lot of healing. And I don't think you can just ask anybody to do that. As soon as I found out that she needed a kidney and that a living related donor would be the best one, I said that she could have mine. The transplant was a success. And a few months later, Kate was in excellent health and well on her way to a full recovery. But Kate must still take 29 pills every day to stop her body from rejecting her sister's kidney. A kidney from her clone would be a perfect match. If I needed a kidney and I could get one from a clone, I would definitely do it. Because the most important thing would be that you wouldn't have to take the anti-rejection medicine. Because I see what my sister's gone through. And I think that's the hardest thing about the kidney operation is that she has to take so much medication. And since Kate's new kidney may only last for 10 to 20 years, she may have to go through the transplant process again. At that time, human cloning may be an option. It has always been rejected. No one has succeeded. They have extended the period of time, you know, but it doesn't last forever. Eventually, the, the alien uh, organ dies. All right, so then, if a man and a woman is together, sexually, that is, when a man releases semen into the woman, it's what? Alien. It's alien to her. What is the first thing her body thinks to do? attack but they found out scientists that there's a certain part, part of the brain that triggers and it releases a serum that creates a egg 
inside the womb of the mother. It's an egg or a bag, a pouch. You follow that? And the baby or the fetal is in this bag. And it's kept in a lubricant, lubricant of water that is producing the hormones so that it is actually fighting against her invading the baby and killing it. When the, when the, when the brain does not trigger this properly, you hear me? And it doesn't send enough of these defense mechanisms, there's a miscarriage. Right? If too many of these things get in the bloodstream and into the baby, when the baby is born, within six to eight weeks, there's cradle death. It's still attacked the baby. They'll tell you they don't know what cradle death is, because they don't know. <laughs> but it's a scientific fact. So now, what actually happens is, the baby in the womb of the human female as a mammal is living in a sack of water. Has anybody here been raised on farm? Good. Well, I mean, you see a hen laying egg, right? Does it come out hard or soft? A lot of, a lot of city folk might not know that. When a, no, not tell me, but they don't. Uh, when a hen lays an egg, it's soft. The bottom, and then when it hits the air, it begins to harden. The same thing happens with the placenta of the woman. When they first remove it from the woman, it's soft. In just in a couple of minutes, it starts to harden up the clots. What am I reaching at? I'm reaching at the fact that women have an egg inside of them. Did they really give birth to an egg? But unlike the, the chickadee, it cracks the shell on the outside of the body. You call it my water breaking. And the egg breaks inside and the baby comes forth. And sometimes they'll say the egg collapsed and put a thin veil over the baby's face. And uh, let's say the medieval doctors who didn't quite understand what that meant said that baby was born with a seventh veil and a, and a veil over his face. That's a mystical baby. He's going to be psychic or clairvoyant or something and that passed all the way down to grandma saying seventh kid seventh kid of a seventh kid has a seventh veil on the face all that was was the shell of the egg collapsing got your attention don't you <laughs> well science is very interesting i've always told y'all for years study science but once you master science religion looks funny you know i mean it looks real cute but it's a nice it's a nice institution people need it people need it, it keeps them out of trouble <laughs> but it has nothing to do with this. What are we saying here? We're saying that human beings are a form of mammal that has an egg inside and the baby is developed in a liquid substance so thus the baby is breathing with gills and does not inherit its lungs until it comes and sometimes in the hospital they have to pump water out of the baby's lungs showing it the, just like the the movie uh the, what's it called? the abyss that the lungs were full of water until it so there's a transformation or a metamorphosis from a sea creature with with gills to a land creature with lungs within that period um, the frightening part about it is that when we go back to religious doctrine, especially Western world religious doctrine and Middle Eastern religious doctrine, such as Islam and Christianity, we get this character called the devil who becomes a serpent, a snake. Now, of course, in our doctrine, we've always had a problem with a talking snake in the garden so it didn't ever sit with us that a snake was holding a conversation with Eve didn't make sense to us and that was our way of, of asking them to explain it we understood he was a Drago we understood Drago and Dragon is in the Bible as Tainini we understood that right but they didn't so it was more fun to say we told us how, you know, how a snake could talk who they're calling the devil in Genesis chapter 3 
traveling all the way to Revelations as the dragon. But this being called the devil was identified with a serpent when they say Leviathan. Again, if they give it, you look it up in the Bible, they say a big sea creature. Tainim, a walking dragon, right on the temples of Babylon, they used to have the drawing of a snake with legs. All right. Then scientists admitted that the original snake had hips. We've shown that in our books. If the original snake had hip bones, then it had legs. Then like the Bible will now on your belly shell you go, unless the scientists did that before and wrote that after, on your belly shell you go in the days of your life, became, oh, so the snake once walked around on four with a snake body and he dropped down. Well, that's the Komodo dragon. That's why a whole bunch of kids are attracted to having um, lizards and what's the other one they have in the houses? The iguanas and they're attracted to this creature while people wrap snakes around them and keep snakes and stuff as pets and feed their snake chickens, little chickadees like it's okay and watch them consume it. There's some, there's some uh, parental <laughs> tie to the lizard and the monkey to make the man. The monkey being uh, the uh, mammal that uses its lungs and the les lizard being the uh, repti reptilian that uses its gills and lays eggs. Now, some reptilians lay eggs on land, some reptilians lay eggs in sea, and some reptilians keep the eggs inside their body and deliver them just like a human being does after the fetal has reached its growth stage. You hear me? What is coming into reality is that when we go back to ancient Tamara, the original name of uh, Egypt, and we look into our old ancestors, when they speak about the birth of the world, they speak about the primordial egg. Remember that? Western world stole it and called it the goose that laid the golden egg. The goose that lays the golden egg is a goose that lays the sun, because the sun has always been a symbol of your own. And they also stole it and came up with the stork that delivers the baby. Now let's combine the two. The goose that lays the golden egg and the stork that delivers the baby says that children are coming from a bird. We have three powerful birds in ancient Tamara. The falcon, the hawk, and the buzzard. Those are the three most powerful birds. The reason why they call them the most powerful birds is because Ra, Amun, and Horus all shared symbols throughout the writings and hieroglyphics where they, they were at one or other time depicted as one of those birds, all of the birds. The wise bird, of course, was the owl. But what separated the owl from the other three birds is that he's the only bird with his eyes in the front of his face like a human. No other bird on the planet has his eyes in the front of his face, and he's also a nocturnal hunter like humans. Say so what? Well, see, humans see better in the dark than they do in the light. And this is why when they walk into a dark room for the first couple of minutes, they can't see. And after a few seconds, things start coming to shape and form. We really see better in the dark when we do the light, but we've been told cut on the light to see our way around. Because the people who govern us and create the laws don't see well in the dark. So they gotta lighten everything up. You hear me? But way back then, they said that Ra, the sun deity, came from noon. Noon, the Muslims even stole it and put it in the Quran as an initial letter, noon. And they said noon represents the what? The well that Jonah was in. It's also in the Hebraic teachings too. Noon, the well that Jonah was in. You see that? Man inside of a fish or man in fish. Now the definition given in ancient Tamara of the man and the fish or the human reptilian was a poppy or papa. 
What is that? Father. That's the Pope. He wears a fish-shaped hat and identifies with an ancient Babylonian deity called Dagon, which identifies with an ancient Malian fleet of gods that came from heaven and the tribe is called the Dogon, and the beings that came to them were called the Namus. And they were supposed to, according to Dogon writings, you hear me? Roam, roam at night only and go into the sea during the day. So they live in the sea. Well, then we go to Sudan and we find that they say beneath the Nile, there are beings that live there. Denaired. Understand? And these, they say in their traditions, these beings come out at night to teach human beings and stay in the water by day. It's like at night, you instinctively say, it's nighttime, I'm going to go to bed, I must take a bath and get into water. You get up in the morning and say, well, I'm getting ready to face the world. I got to go take a, boy, my skin is dry. I must moisture it. Otherwise, what will happen? My scales will start to show. We call it rashiness and ashiness. But what we're really saying is, if I don't keep the outer surface of my skin moist, I will dehydrate and scale off and can scrape off dead skin like any other reptilian. Oh yeah. Seven human beings, jaw bones are constructed where their front teeth and their bottom teeth don't touch. Their back two teeth connect. Oh, lot of them. They're round. Okay. She's, she's, she's on, I got her. They don't touch. They have a round, you know, their mouth is round. You ever seen that? Because those other mammals and stuff chew their could. So they constantly chew their food over and over with their back teeth, swallow it into one stomach or the other, and then regurgitate it again and chew it again, like cows and stuff called chewing their could. You see? But certain, for some reason, certain of us human beings, if we all come in one strain, certain of us have the mouth for fish. We have this obsession that it is romantic to make love near the water on the beach. It is natural to go into the water to bathe before we make love. Your father, we drink water all day. Otherwise, we will be doctors say you better keep taking in liquids. If you took a fish and put it in a container, the only way you can keep that fish alive if you don't put it back in water is to do what? Keep on putting, keep it wet. Y'all hear me? So in our ancient day, in ancient, in our time, ancient, I don't know what to do with y'all. Back in ancient Egypt, in ancient Sumeria, they say the same thing. A fish man came out of the Tigris Euphrates and taught the Sumerians. Now the An Anutu, Anutu is the name they have before they get to Gi. Or key. When they get to B or Ki, Anutu changes into Anunaki. And that's Anu, Na, and Gi, or Ki. Or uh, one of the names for the planet Earth. Ancient Egyptian or Tamara name for the planet Earth was Tani. Tani. Tani is in your Bible where they have serpent. Not in Genesis chapter 3, they purposely selected another word, Nakash. And they uh, selected that word Nakash because it means divination in Hebrew or to whisper. And of course, the Muslims who steal everything from the Jews brought over into the Quran and simple Nas and call it Khanas. Nakash, Khanas. And in the Quran, it's still written up as the whispering devil. You hear me? So we have a tie-in to people coming out the water and teaching us 
whether it was in Mali at the Dogon, which also would cover Senegal and Morocco and uh, Mediterranean, all the Moorish places, because all that was one at one time. Then we have Al Gore, Al Gore, which is where Arabia and all that area was, and they have in their writings that fish people, people who are half human, half fish in some form or fashion, came out and taught them. And then we go into Egypt, and we have the primordial egg coming up out floating along the sea and coming out of the water was Ra, right? And from Ra, of course, Atum uh, gave birth to, to that Ra principle. Then we have those three moods of the of the ray, which was really the ray, not Ra. And those three moods of the ray was Atum, Atun, and Amun. And Atun was also referred to as simply Tun. He was Tun in the morning, and he was, he was I'm sorry, at Tun in the morning, and Tun in the evening, where apparently, or as they say, the sun sets, where set, where the setting of the sun comes in, where they travel the darkness through the shadow and come back around again each morning for the sun to come back. But still, it meant going beneath the sea. They didn't look at the sun in ancient Egypt as going beneath the land. They saw it as going beneath the sea, and they would go down in the morning at the sea, and they wait for the sun to come over. And they say, God brought the water up to them. This was the ancient sun worship custom. And what they were looking at is the sun apparently to come over the horizon and as it traveled the water, they stood on the, on the dry land near the beach in the morning, their hands raised up and they watched it and they watched it come up and they did this with it until the sun bathed them in the warmth and the vitality and, the, and, and they knew that that was the rays that would grow their food and they gave thanks at that moment. That was Babylonian, Egyptian, African, Mayan, Aztecian, Eskimo, everybody except the Christian. And of course, the Christian regurgitated and gave birth to Muslims. <laughs> Which means they took portions of Christianity and Judaism and fabricated their own religion. All right, called Islam. But even it is based on the sun. And Christianity is based on the sun. It's just that they made the sun a man and called him the Egyptians made the sun Ray a man and called him Amun so he became Amun Ray Lord Jesus Christ the Hindus did the same thing the Dogon did the same thing they all prayed to the sun you follow and the sun is the most deadly thing that a reptilian could get caught in because the sun will so it was hell to get caught in the sun so they created from the greek word helios from where the egyptians or the greeks called the egyptian city heliopolis helios hell and told their people one time no one thought hell was down they thought hell was up they thought as you go toward the sun or that the sun was coming down to earth to burn everybody. That's in the Bible. Coming down to earth to burn you up. In fact, they say in the Bible, the Lord will no longer destroy the world by water, but more by fire. They're thinking of the fire burning the whole world up.
until it passes its three stages. And only people that understood sun worship and Atun, Atun, and Amun would know the stages, you see. So Christianity set it up where to look like they know they worship on Sunday, you see. And they put a halo or halo, helios, a ring of gold around Christ's head, which is the iris of the God's way of Egypt, a circular. And so the Greeks knew his name was Asaru, so they called him Osiris. And put the big O there, because if you look in any science book under the symbol of the sun, you get a big cycle. Yeah, that. And Lu meant primitive. Lu cipher meant primitive cipher. Yeah. Lucifer became the primitive cipher for the bright morning star, which is the sun. So Christ was called the early morning star, and then in Isaiah, Lucifer is called the bright morning star, both representing the sun disk. You hear me? So there is a relationship between morals here, men, women, and reptilians. That's why, if you hold up your hand and look at it, it's yours, you can do it. <laughs> Stretch your fingers as far as you can apart and now turn over and look back and look between here and you'll see you once had webs. You may not like the way it looks, but if you have skin that must stay moist, if you have the ability to reanimate limbs, you understand? If you have webs and scales, and, and need water and then we'll take a hen's egg and eat it soft scrambled or write out the egg mix it up for vitality do you know that snakes hunt down other snake eggs and turtle eggs they swallow them and then they spit out the shell so when you're having that sunny side egg and your wife said, that's slimy looking. Why are you eating that? That slimy egg that you're eating is an identification with your reptilian nature. That obsession with swimming pools and beaches and, and salt water, the moment you jump into salt water, you, it goes right into your head and clears it up. So man, I had a cold before I died in here. All of dust and mucus that was in the air just went out to that in the salt water. Why? Why are you so comfortable in salt water? Why you why is it now listen? If I took salt and threw it in your face, what would happen? What would it do to your eyes? So how come you can open your eyes in the salt water in the beach? And the salt that you get is from the salt water in the beach. Why is it that once you get back under the water, your body readjusts immediately? And your nerves in the eyes do not pick do not pick up the salt as something that's attacking it, but you're able to give it this. Why is it? Because you'll have the ability to readapt to your original environment. Because if you went right, if me and you went to the beach right now and dive under the water, we could open our eyes. If I went right to the house and got a uh, sea salt and put it in your eyes, you'd have a fit. <laughs> so what happens is when you're standing on dry land, your 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 body 
calibrates where you are and adjusts itself for where you are. And when you dive in the water, the moment it hits the water, your body has to recalibrate itself and adjust it to where you are. You follow? Just that quick. So there are reptilians like the alligator and the crocodile who can come out of the water and stay on dry land for a while, longer than they should. And then while breathing air, go back in, especially hippopotamus, which is why hippopotamus was the highest guard in Egypt, then go back in under the water and breathe under water, hippopotamus. Or the limp to you, which I'm going towards, the whale, which they also proved was on land before it got into the water, still has its lungs, and your ancestor, the dolphin, who transported you sea here to this planet to be, to be germinated and grown. <coughs> Dolphins are your ancestors. That is when you have a relationship to the dolphin. You know? <laughs> you can go to SeaWorld and Disney World and watch a whole bunch of talent going, tree, 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 tree. the dolphin won't come nowhere near them. You walk over there and make one sound like the dolphin and they'll come look. Look up at you. And look to see if you know. And if you don't know, they're just going about their business. <laughs> if they see you know, they'll stick their head up. You can pat them. And they'll go back to work. So much for your relationship to the reptilians or the sea creatures. Let's get back. Let's get into other subjects first. Unless that you got hooked and you want to play. <laughs> well, you better do Everybody. Miss that part about the human being more 90%. 90% of the child, the part he said he missed, 90% of a child between a male and a female is a female. Because all of the the components to make up the child is coming from her. The man is in distress. The semen is in distress from the moment it gets in the body because the woman's natural antibodies are going after it to destroy it because there's something alien until his blood right. because the baby takes from her um, immune system to protect themselves against the baby to protect his no, that the, the, the baby has to go has to trigger something in the brain so it otherwise the mother will kill the baby this extends out of the womb and it's called post postpartum where women can flicker and beat their baby to death with a spoon or throw it out the window or put it up and they do all kinds of things the doctors have written that off as a you know a mental defect you know, it's, but 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 accept it. Yes. Well, um, at least I want to start after the sixth month. At least after the sixth month, you should stop having sexual relationship. You care more about training your body and exercising and preparing to um, yield a basketball <laughs> as opposed to you know <laughs> stimulate you know for pleasure. You know, because that's your body. That your body does have to be prepared for that. You know, but if if during that period of time, you, the man ejaculates the woman, semen ain't going anywhere anyway, because everything closed up. Huh? The baby was born. The woman already being pregnant, and it happened that that this inside the womb is it a bad thing to have the um, the sperm being injected into a woman being infected? You know, um, attack it anyway. No, I'm saying because the brain is now. Since she became pregnant, the brain produced the sound to protect it, so it won't, it won't, it won't, it won't give any harm at all. Brother, the way up there. Um, what happened is dolphins are beings from the Cirrus star. Cyrus, they call it. Cyrus star. <coughs> and the Neptunum which is the Egyptian name for the Anunnaki, used them to put the seed of human beings in the dolphin in order to transport it from one place to the other. They do that now 
in laboratory will take the egg of one animal and inject it into another animal in order to fly it from one laboratory to the other side and then take it out and then inseminate it inside to inside of an egg for development. When they were bringing the, uh, let's say the fish man from Cyrus, which was a, a predominantly water planet to earth, they did it in a sea creature called a dolphin, which is much, much, is a little different than he looks today. He's also evolution. And then injected it here in the, in the, in the monkey, right? Because you have two different seeds here. You have the gibbon, which goes into the, to the chimpanzee, and then you have the other one who went to the, the baboon and the jackal. Um, like from the, the baboon, I don't want to go that far. When it goes to the baboon and the orangutan, which is the Caucasian side of the monkey. And then you have the gibbon, which, which is the working thumb. That's why we have more coordination than they do. You know, we're, we're much more agile than them. Because the monkey that's in our genes is called a gibbon, and he has working, his hand works, he can grasp things. Whereas the orangutan can't grasp nothing unless he holds it like this. He doesn't have a working thumb, his thumb is too far down. This is why there are a lot of Tamil who, you notice, know, you look at their toes, their toes are extremely long. And sometimes the first three, the, the first toe is real short, the next two, three is like all three the same size. The hand structures are a lot different now, and they literally, understand the racist thing, this is scientific fact, and they literally move different than we do, bodily wise. They don't know how we move the way we do, how agile or colorful as they turn for it is. But they use those scientists, those gods, those Netaru, those Anutu, the Namus, use the dolphin to transport the gene to Earth from Sirius and then the laboratories, Shimti on Mars, which they found the laboratories on Mars in a place called Sidonia, and they're trying to cover it up, because but it's too late. Everybody knows the truth now. There's life on Mars, and that's and they have now then they transport it here to Earth. And they use these other biological entities or some biological, some of them are mechanical, which called rays, which they made from mammals on this planet. And they like made a Frankenstein, the whole concept of the Frankenstein movie that they show you is when the Anunnaki were making rays. And they use these rays to trap, go into environments that they who will have the same anatomy like you and their planet service had the same kind of atmosphere as yours, which is another name for risk, right? They used, they, they had to use beings that could go into other planets like Mars where they couldn't survive on that. And then those beings went there and built spheres. We discussed this the other day. They'll call it, uh, they'll say that planet Earth has, is a biosphere and it's not a biosphere because bio means two. And spheres, any specific place where life or matter exists. So we have the ability to live under the ground. We have the ability to live in water. We have the ability to live in air within the Earth's atmosphere. And then we have the ability to live now with space stations outside. So we don't have a biosphere, we have a quadrosphere. And if they come and create a dome structure and move people in it, now we got a what? It's going into a, what's a fifth? A quick, a quick, now it becomes a quixosphere. But they'll say we have a biosphere. We're living in several different atmospheres on the planet Earth at the same time. And several different life forms are living together in each of these spheres. But only one or two of them are capable of living beneath water in a space station. Like if I fly from here to, um, Let's say Asia, I may spend 17 hours in a plane. You know what I'm saying? As long as I stay in any environment more than eight hours, I've altered the, the natural course of things, which means I should spend eight hours sleeping, eight hours eating, and eight hours digesting and dissipating. That's the three eights that make up the 24 hours in a human being. If I spend 17 hours in the air, I get jet lag, my body has to go through change, I have to readjust, I have to be recalibrated when I get my feet on the ground. It's the same thing if you go swimming and you mess around in water too long, when you get on the ground, you're, 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 when you get back on the ground, your body feels real strange. That strange feeling is your body you're touching the ground, 
dealing with levity, gravity, density, moist, and it's recalibrating itself. And then a couple of minutes after that, you feel normal again. You understand? You okay now? Y'all okay now? Peace.